here we are again, churching online. It's going to be a few more weeks before we can get together again in person. Yesterday, the provincial government announced um, a strategy, a timeline for reopening. And as soon as it is uh, possible, feasible for us to, to get together again, we will absolutely be doing that. Um, we'll let you know. But in the meantime, here we are. And whatever it is that you've just finished doing, whatever it is you need to do next, I hope that you can take some time to sit still, to hear what God has to say to you, and to ask yourself what it is that he wants to hear back. So we begin by praying together. Pray with me. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, help us to hear them, to read them, to mark them, to learn them, to inwardly digest them, so that by patience and by the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of eternal life which you have given in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For the last few weeks, we've been looking at some things that we do together as believers, things that we have not been able to do together for a while and that we are looking forward to being able to do again. We looked at taking communion together. And when we do that, that is an act of worship in which we, we receive into our bodies a remembrance of Jesus' life and death and his promises. We looked at singing together. Uh, when we sing together, that is an act of worship in which we express vocally and physically our celebrations and uh, our pain. We looked at praying together. Praying together is an act of worship in which we, we speak to God in the presence of other believers. And we share with God and with each other um, our thanks and our needs. This week we're looking at learning together. Learning together is an act of worship. When we learn together, we are surrendering our time and we are engaging our intellect to be shaped and challenged in community with other believers. I was talking to a friend this week and uh, we were talking about the things that we find precious, that we find valuable in spending time alone with God. Um, for her, <clears throat> she, she would, you know, get on her horse and go for a ride. And that was some time when she could be alone with God. For me, um, you know, going for a walk or just sitting still and listening to the birds and hearing what God has to say to me. That's time that I value, spending alone with God. We read the Bible on our own. We read good books written by other believers on our own. We can listen to, and you know, thank God for this right now, we can listen to some wonderful teachers online, some powerful podcasts that, that speak to our hearts and our souls and, and speak uh, scripture into our lives. Those are all things that we can do on our own. But it is important to know that however precious and valuable those things are, they do not replace the time that we can spend learning together. Also known as going to church and listening to the sermon that time of learning together. It's not just sitting and listening. This is an act of worship. This is time that we spend together engaging with God. 
when we read the Bible on our own, it is really important for us to remember that most of the Bible was not written to individuals. It was written to groups of people. It was written to families and tribes and races and nations and teams and churches. There are a few exceptions, but the majority of what you read in the Bible was written to a group. Now we can find a lot of personal encouragement in passages that we find in Scripture. I think in particular of uh, Jeremiah 29 11, which many of you may be able to just recite off the top of your head because it says something powerful to us as individuals. Jeremiah quotes God as saying, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster, but to give you a future and a hope. But the thing is, when Jeremiah said that in the original language, that you was plural. He was speaking to the nation. He was speaking to everybody who followed Yahweh God. He was saying, I know the plans I have for you guys, for you all together. When Moses spoke the words, I have set before you death and life, blessing and curse, choose life, love the Lord your God. He was speaking to an entire generation who had gathered to hear him. He was reminding them together of their part in what God was doing. When King Josiah, look him up, important story, good story. When King Josiah stood in the temple and read aloud the scriptures, he was reading to all of the assembled people of Jerusalem, calling his entire nation back to the word of God. When Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, he was speaking in the plural. He was speaking to a group of disciples who were together hearing and learning as Jesus laid the foundation for how they and we today are to live. When the Apostle Peter offered the first explanation, the first sermon, the first lesson on who Jesus had been and was continuing to be all throughout history. He spoke his challenge to a group of people who had gathered to hear him. When the Apostle Paul wrote the words, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, plural. Paul was writing a letter, not to an individual, but he was writing a letter that he would hand to a woman named Phoebe who would take it to Rome, who would gather the church. She would read the letter aloud to the gathered people of that congregation and teach them from that letter. And they didn't just do that because you know, well, Zoom hadn't been invented yet. There was no YouTube, so they had to get together. Now, they did that intentionally and on purpose because spending time together, worshiping and learning together was and is a core, core part of who they and we are and how we live out our life the rest of the week. When we, again, have the opportunity to get together in the same place at the same time, to hear the same teaching. There are some things that I know will be true of that. The first is that we will be hearing from someone who knows us, someone who is one of us, who understands what's happening in our community and how we as individuals are coping. A second thing that will be happening when we gather together to learn will be that I will be learning side by side with people whose experiences and understandings of life and scripture 
are a bit different from mine and that I can learn from them even just by trying to hear what is being taught through their lenses and wondering what does she think of that that he just said another thing that will happen when we are together in the same place learning together is that we will all be thinking the same thing at the same time we will all be hearing the words and asking ourselves is that really true of us is that really who we are and what are we going to do about it learning together learning together is an act of worship there aren't a lot of songs about listening to sermons there aren't a lot of songs about learning and being taught so the songs <clears throat> that I'm including this morning in the service are ones that I particularly appreciate because they are taken almost verbatim from the scriptures. The songwriters have adopted um, the writings of Paul or the writings of a psalm writer and turned them into a song that we can sing together, that we can learn from together. I hope that you will sing with me, sing along this morning, and I hope that when our doors are open again, that you will join us, maybe for the first time, maybe for the millionth, but that you will come together and that you will learn with me who we are and what we are supposed to be doing about it.
Good morning, everyone. I am reading Acts chapter 2 from verse 1 to 13, reading from the New International Version. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there was sitting in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hear them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Jews, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own towns. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they are, they've had too much wine. Here ends the reading. Have a wonderful day. Welcome everyone to uh, First Baptist Church online, which will, which is where we'll be for a few more weeks, it looks like, from what the government of Ontario has said. And welcome to my bench. <laughs> if you're ever walking downtown, you probably may find me on this bench reading. This is my reading bench whenever uh, the weather is nice. And behind me is uh, First Baptist Church, uh, the building where we hope to get back to meeting again in person real soon. Uh, the building was built in 1867. It's kind of neat. It's easy to remember because the building is as old as Canada. Um, it was built on property owned by William Craig, who at the time was the mayor of Port Hope and a very prominent uh, member of the community and member of the church. And so he donated the land to the church. The church, which had been in existence for about 12 years at that time, raised the money to build the building and 140 some odd years later it's still standing they don't build buildings like that anymore um, it's a part of Port Hope's history um, we were part of a historical tour a couple of years ago someone from the Port Hope Historical Society came and along with some members of our church uh, guided people on a historical visit through the church but the church is more than a building, and a church is more than history. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and Pentecost Sunday celebrates the birth of the church from Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit fell on the believers. And then Peter, who was once um, the person who denied Jesus and who uh, was afraid to stand up for him, uh, stood up in front of everybody and explained what was going on and preached the church's first sermon. And I think it was 3,000 people were saved that day and the church began. So on this Pentecost Sunday, we want to look at the church, not just the building, as nice as it is and as historical as it is, but what is a church and what is it supposed to be? And so um, to guide me through this, I consulted a fellow named Ed Stetzer wrote this book called Comeback Churches and I've heard him speak and he's probably one of the top uh, church studiers in all North America he studies what's going on in the church and writes things to church leaders 
to help them understand what's going on. And in this book, he outlines six important components of a biblical church. And these are all things that we, as First Baptist Church, want to strive to be. So what are the six signs of a biblical church? Well, the first one is scriptural authority, the authority of the Bible. In our church, we have this big stained glass window that is over the, is over the front door of the church. Huge circle. It's got a particular name for the style of the stained glass. I can't remember what it is. But I know when we had that historical tour, the, the person from the historical society was so excited to show everybody this beautiful window. And it's massive. And right in the middle of it is an open Bible. And in the circle around the Bible, it says the words, search the scriptures. And I love it. I love that that's there embedded in our history because that is such an important aspect. A key to a biblical church is to search the scriptures, to, to endeavor that everything we do and everything we say is rooted in God's word. And I've always said, um, this is my first church where I'm preaching every Sunday morning. I, in my previous work as in youth work, I got a chance to preach on Sundays and, excuse me, every now and then. But this is the first time when weekly preaching is part of what I do. And I always say my, my goal is to preach from the Word of God and not opinions. <laughs> I always try to stay away from opinions and root everything that I talk about from the Word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, And now, how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is God-breathed and is youth useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scriptures are meant to lead us to salvation. The scriptures are meant to point the way to Jesus so that through him we can be connected to our Creator, God the Father. The scriptures are God-breathed. It's an interesting way of putting it. Um, the Bible wasn't dictated. You know, God didn't sit down to Moses and say, okay, Moses, take a letter. Grab your, grab your quill and let's start writing. Or to Paul, take a letter. No, it's in some way God breathed his word into these people and, and worked through their personalities, their skills and their talents, and the scriptures were written. They were inspired. These individuals were inspired by God to write what was written. And the scriptures are inherent, inerrant, sorry, inerrant in what they pr propose to cover. Um, the scriptures are not meant to be a political treatise or a science textbook, but in what the scriptures cover and they're meant to cover, which is to impact the spiritual life of the reader. Um, then they are inerrant. They are, their word is fully inspired from God. And scriptures are useful for teaching, for, for rebuking. That's not always the fun part, right? Rebuking, that's correcting, that's... Well, we, we might say scolding in today's, word, in today's language, but not in the sense of uh, condemning, but in the sense of pointing, or putting the... Scriptures can put its finger on what's wrong in our lives and then give us the means by which to change through God's, God's help and God's moving in our lives. Scripture is useful for training and it equips us for every good work through studying the scriptures and learning what God has to say to us through his word. It gets us ready to do the stuff on this earth that God has put us here to do. So a biblical church subscribes to scriptural authority. A biblical church has biblical leadership. In Philippians 4, it talks about how Christ has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, a pastor's job description can be rather broad and rather varied, and, uh, and sometimes the job description is biblical and sometimes the expectations people have of a pastor can exceed a job description to a degree. The pastor does his best to do what he can. But in, a set, in essence, the pastor's job, my job, is to equip you to do the works of service in Jesus' name. 
God saves us for a purpose. He's given us each a mission to fulfill. We have, we have a, a purpose for being on this earth. And, and my job is to help you figure that out and to help you through scripture and through growing in Christ to be able to know and understand why you're here, to know and understand why Christ has called you, that he has called you, that you're important, you matter, you're here for a purpose, and to do what I can to help you achieve that. Um, my job is to help you figure out what that mission is and do whatever I can to help you fulfill it. How can First Baptist help you accomplish what you feel on your heart that God wants you to do? And the job of a church leader is to help all of us grow in maturity in our faith, and that's part of the leader too. As a pastor and as church leaders, we never stop growing ourselves or should never stop growing ourselves. And there's always room to improve, always room to grow, always room to know Jesus more and to understand Him more, His purpose for our lives, and what it is He's called us to do. A biblical church uh, has as a key component preaching and teaching. Opportunities to hear God's Word, to, to read it, to study it, to apply it and to meditate on God's Word and to be able to, to understand it better, to help those who don't yet know Jesus to, to find Him and to figure out what He means in their lives and to th help those of us who do know Jesus to, to know Him more. And it's our job as a church to, to provide opportunities through preaching and teaching and, and those happen right now, right, right now, <laughs> what we're doing now on Sunday morning, online, just sharing truths from God's Word that you can hear and listen and, and apply to your lives. And on Monday evening, on Zoom, we are going through the Gospel of Mark, kind of section by section. And it's been really good so far, and I'm really looking forward to continuing to dive into these stories about Jesus and the teachings and the things He said. As the summer rolls along, and we start to be allowed to meet in small groups outdoors, which should happen, I think, this week even, um, we're going to start something called Lunch at the Garden. We have, I don't know if you can see it behind me, probably not, but we have two spots, two plots around the church where we grow uh, a food bank garden, where we grow vegetables and, and flowers and, and things that we will, once they're fully grown, donate to the food bank. And it's a great opportunity for people to come and exercise their green thumb and just work together on a nice day in the outdoors. And on Tuesdays, uh, Ruth will gather with whoever wants to come and work on the garden a little bit and bring your lawn chairs and have lunch. Socially distanced around the garden. And also in doing that, we'll have a time to, to share with each other and read the, read the scriptures a bit and maybe try to learn something new from what the Bible has to say to us. And when we're back in person, we'll get back to having what we had before, the Thursday morning ladies Bible study and the Wednesday night youth group and where we take time to look into God's Word. Um, we just want to continue to create opportunities where people can hear God's Word and be taught and given the opportunity to apply what God has to say to us through His Scriptures to our lives. Another part of a biblical church are what is called the ordinances. Now you're like, what is an ordinance? I don't understand that. but. In the, in the Baptist tradition and most evangelical churches, there are two ordinances of the church. One is the Lord's Supper. Now, I know in Anglican churches, they'll have that every week. Uh, we do it once a month, and it's a tangible reminder of the death of Christ for our sins. The second ordinance we have, it's uh, again, most evangelical churches have it, but as a Baptist church, it's something really important to us is baptism. And that's an outward symbol of an inward commitment and change. Um, baptism doesn't save you. It doesn't make you a part of the church. It's just a symbol on the outside of what's already going on in the inside. And that's why it's so important to baptize people uh, once they're old enough to understand what they're doing. I was, I was going to say as adults, but I was 12 when I was baptized. My sister, I think, was 10. I've seen people baptized as young as 9. As long as they are old enough to understand the commitment that they've made to Jesus and that what they're doing in being water baptized is showing to everybody who's there, who's watching, that they want to follow Jesus. And just as Jesus was baptized in water, um, 
being baptized in water is a demonstration that, that we want to follow Jesus. That the water is a symbol of cleansing and purification, that Christ has cleansed us from our sins, not because of the baptism, but because we've already asked him to forgive us and to become Lord and Savior of our lives. And we believe in, in dunking, <laughs> baptism by immersion, the symbolism there of dying to your old self and then rising again to new life in Christ. These are both important parts of, of who we are as a church, and that's been one of the sad parts about the lockdowns and everything is, is these are two things that we haven't been able to practice a whole lot. It's hard to do baptism online. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, we, we look forward to the opportunity to be able to, to fully incorporate the Lord's Supper and baptism into our, into our church community again. And that's the fifth um, element of a biblical church, and that is community, covenant community. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47 talk about how the early believers shared the same convictions. They ate together, they prayed together, they, they met together with glad and sincere hearts. They, they helped meet each other's needs. Galatians 6, 2 says to help carry one another's burdens. And in doing so, you fulfill the law of Christ. We at First Baptist Church like to use the imagery of family that we are a family. I, I, and I will use that term often from the pulpit to emphasize how, how important that is. And I remember, oh, I think it was two or three years ago, I was talking about community and family. And I, I looked out in the congregation and I saw Bertha DeMille, who was with us then. She's since passed away. She was, I think, 93 or 94 at the time. And I looked at Victoria McCall, who was our youngest person at the church, and she was nine or 10. And I said, we are a family. Bertha and Victoria, you are sisters. <laughs> you are sisters, the, regardless of the age difference. And I remember Victoria in particular was quite struck by how, how neat that was. And, and the church is a neat community that it brings together people of different ages, different backgrounds, um, different, you know, they've come from different places, different, different jobs, different careers. It brings them together with one thing in common, and that is Jesus Christ. And in Jesus, there's community, and there's a depth of community. It's as wonderful as belonging to a club is, where you, you all share the same thing. I, I am on a Facebook page um, called Hockey Books, because I love reading hockey books. You could tell from the hat. I'm recording this after the Canadians won the first game against the Maple Leafs. My deepest apologies to Leafs fans. By the time you're seeing this, though, you will have seen Saturday night's game, and hopefully they will come out on top. And so I have this connection with all these guys on this Hockey Books Facebook page, but it's not the same. I don't consider them family. We have a shared interest. But when you have a shared interest, when your shared interest is Jesus Christ, you are brought together in family. You, are, you have a depth of commitment and a depth, a depth of community. And you don't bail on family. You know, one of the things that always hurts me is, is watching people, Christians church hop, leave one church to go to another because, oh, I'm not happy, they're not doing things the way I want to there, and they go somewhere else. And I don't think that's the way it was meant to be. You don't bail on family. And so if, if things are going, uh, things are difficult in a church, you're having issues with certain people or certain, certain things, talk it out work it out come to an understanding realize you may not always get what you want but then the other person may not always get what they want either that's what it's like in a family you work things out but you stick together and so as a church we want to be a family we want to be a community we're part as a, of a larger family too and that's the church worldwide and that is so cool um, to know that when we meet on sunday morning there are millions of people around the world meeting at the same time and worshiping the same God and even within our town you know we have Kingdom Life Fellowship, Grace Missionary Church, Fellowship Baptist, Calvary Pentecostal, a number of others that that uh, are part of our family, our extended family and every Good Friday we get together four churches in town get together and hold a joint service well <laughs> we haven't for the last two Good Fridays hopefully and prayerfully you know next Good Friday we can get back to doing that um, but we're part of a larger family, the church worldwide. 
And the community aspect of the church, I think, is going to be all the more important when we come out of COVID, because I think that is one thing that so many people are missing, and that's community. Just the opportunity to be together, the opportunity to give someone you, you care about a hug, um, the opportunity to just eat a meal together in a large group. Um, and so as a church, it's something that we want to strive to do, to continue to, to protect community and to build community so that when we come out of this COVID pandemic, that people who are searching for community um, will feel welcome and will find a place to belong in our community. And as they do, hopefully that, that we can find ways that would point them to the source of our community, and that's Jesus Christ. The one interesting thing about my park bench is that I'm near the train tracks. And so I may have to talk a little louder because oh, that looks like the passenger train going by, so it may not be too long. Um, <laughs> but I have one more point. Yeah, it's the passenger train, it's short. My last point here for Biblical Church is that we are all called to mission. The church has a purpose, and that purpose is not to maintain a nice historical building. The purpose is not to make its members comfortable or to please them. The church exists for others. The church exists primarily as a place of worship to God, but it also exists as a place of community to others place of serving others, a place where we would go and reach out beyond ourselves to be able to help and serve others and, and show them the way to, to, to know a relationship with Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, 19, 20, the last two verses of the Gospel of Matthew talk about our purpose and our mission being to share the Gospel and make disciples. Share the Gospel to help others find Jesus, to help others find the, the love and the um, the purpose in life that we have found in Him. And we do that through preaching and teaching and relationship and community. But it's also to help people mature in their faith, making disciples, help that we help each other dig deeper into God's Word and to grow in our faith. And our mission is also, we're not here for ourselves. We're not here to serve the members of the club. We're here to meet the needs of the community around us. We are called to be missionaries in our community. And we think of missionaries as being people who go to other countries and, um, and, and share the gospel there. But more and more churches are realizing that as important as that is, we are also called to be missionaries in our own town, missionaries to the world around us. And there's a parallel there into what missionaries do in other countries and what we are called to do here. A missionary will go and they'll learn the language and they'll understand the context and the culture of where they're going. And our world has changed a lot in the last 50, 60 years, going back to maybe the 50s where the church was more the center of the community. The church in some ways is more on the outside of the community. And things have changed and we need to understand the language that people speak. You need to understand the culture, the, the context, the way they're living, the way they hear things and understand things so that we can proclaim the good news of Jesus in a way the community understands. We need to listen and hear the questions people are asking. Um, I was reading a book this week and it, it reaffirms something I've always thought is that sometimes the church answers questions that nobody's asking or very few are asking. And we focus sometimes on certain ideas and certain concepts that might be important to us, but to most of the world around us, it's not on their radar. We need to be able to listen and hear the questions and the, hear the cries of people's hearts and try to understand where they're coming from and to answer the questions people are asking. And they were called to be the hands and feet of Jesus by loving others and serving others. Scripture talks about how a cup of cold water given in Jesus' name will not go without a reward. Something as simple as a cup of cold water. Sometimes we think, you know, I've got to do big things. I've got to, and I'm not, I'm not capable. I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. I mean, I, I can't do all these big things that, that's expected of me in terms of serving Jesus. Well, I think we could all manage a cup of cold water. It, whatever it is that your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, the scripture says. Um, 
whatever it is that God has entrusted to you, use it to be able to bless and to serve others. Be Jesus with skin on for those in your sphere of influence, for those near you. I was in business school years ago. I used to talk about mission statements and understanding corporate culture. And it's always important for any organization to kind of do a revisit, to revisit its purpose, to revisit its mission. And it's all the more important for the church. Because even though the church is far from perfect, it is the institution through which God has decided that he is going to make himself known on the earth and make his the message of Jesus Christ known on the earth through the church. And so my desire is for myself and for us at First Baptist Church that we would continually commit ourselves to being a biblical church. And that means that we're committed to God's word to search the scriptures. That we're committed to a leadership that will equip others to serve God and to fulfill their mission. That we will continually offer opportunities to learn and to grow as believers through preaching and teaching. That we will practice the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. That we'll live in a loving, committed community with each other. And that we'll live out our mission to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community.